We all have preferences for things in our world. There are things that we like and things that we don't like. There are things that we find very beautiful and things that we find downright ugly. For example, in this week's Irish Times, they reported a study in which scientists asked people to vote for what they thought was the ugliest animal on Earth. And they voted for this, <laughs> the blobfish. The blobfish was voted by 100,000 people as being the ugliest looking creature on Earth. Now, our sense of the aesthetic, or what we like, or what we dislike, is really fundamental to us as humans. It underpins our social behavior, so we tend to share preferences with the friends that we have, and it also underpins our behavior as consumers. We're willing to spend our hard-earned cash to acquire the things that we like, that house that we like, that car that we like, that handbag that we like, or those shoes that we like. Now, the idea of what is beauty and where did we get this sense of beauty from has exercised the minds of some of the greatest philosophers over the ages. And since the third century, it was thought that beauty is really subjective. Beauty is in the eye of the beholder, and there's nothing really that we can do about that. This turns out to be wrong, and I'll tell you later why that's the case. And it wasn't really until the 18th century that philosophers such as our own Edmund Burke and Immanuel Kant really looked at this issue of what is beautiful a lot more seriously. And Kant himself said that our aesthetic appraisals really have four distinct features to them. They're disinterested appraisals. In other words, these things are not designed to evoke our emotion. They're universal, they're necessary and purposive. Now, in the 21st century, we have a new subdiscipline of neuroscience called neuroaesthetics, and we can really ask some very interesting questions about where does our sense of beauty arise. And we can ask them in an objective way and collect data to support the idea that our preferences arise somehow in our brains. We can ask the question, what are our preferences? Why do we have these preferences? How did we get them in the first place? And how do they arise in the brain? And it's only in recent times that we can really ask these very interesting questions. So some of the evidence in support of the idea that our preferences are universal, that they're not subjective, comes from research on facial attractiveness. And what tends to happen if you ask people to judge faces and whether or not they find them attractive, you get a huge amount of agreement between people on what they find attractive. So, for example, in this study which reported a meta-analysis of data that was reported in several different studies looking at facial attractiveness, they reported that adults really agree with each other on what face they found attractive. So, for example, you get an inter-rate of reliability of about 0.9. This is, you can, can see this as levels of agreement between adults. You also get the same level of agreement amongst children when they're asked to identify what do they find, what faces do they find attractive. And these data typically come from studies that are within culture. But you can also find the same high level of agreement between raters when asked to choose faces that are attractive from a race that other than their own. You get high levels of agreement amongst those raters for faces from a different race and also faces from a different ethnic group within your own culture. So in other words, these data support the idea that our, our preferences are universal and that they are not subjective. In another body of research, we know that if we look at something that's beautiful, it activates regions of the brain, very specific regions of the brain, that are known to be implicated in reward the dopamine regions of the brain. So looking at an attractive face that might be looking at you activates these regions that are the same regions that are activated when we take illicit drugs, for example. So in other words, just merely staring at a pretty face will give you a natural, but legal, high. We can't help but be drawn towards attractive things either. So it, it, it demands our attention. And we tested this idea in the lab recently where we asked people to simply do a very boring task where they had to detect a letter in the middle of an array and report whether or not that letter was upright or upside down. That's all they had to do. 
At the same time, we presented in their peripheral vision very simple visual stimuli that were previously rated as being attractive. Here's an example of one. And what we found was that when these types of images were presented to peripheral vision, these images had an effect on performance. The more attractive this peripheral image was, the more likely the performance was going to drop. We found a 10% reduction in accuracy on this very boring task. I mean, all they had, they had to do was report whether they saw a letter and was it upside down or not. And not only that, but it took them 15% longer <laughs> to do the task. So, in other words, these studies show that Kant had a point that these stimuli, they can be disinterested appraisals, but they're universal, they're necessary, and they're purposive because they have a consequence on our behavior, and they have a consequence on the way that our brain responds to that type of stimulation. Now, in the 21st century, we have a very good idea about how the brain works, and particularly in the last few decades, we have evidence to suggest how the brain is mapped out into its different functional areas. So we know, what, for example, what areas are involved in face recognition, object recognition, etc. We also know a lot more about how the brain takes in information from the different sensory modalities to make sense of our world, to maintain a coherent percept of our world. And what I want to tell you today is that there is no specific region in the brain that's dedicated to judging aesthetics in the things that surround us. Instead, what happens is that aesthetics, or our sense of what's beautiful, is a byproduct of those normal processes that are involved in the brain to detect and recognize and interact with the things that surround us. It's an emergent property of those normal brain processes. So let's just take an example of how the brain might underpin our preferences. Color is a very good example. We all have very strong preferences for color. Everybody likes blue, but girls in particular like pink. And this was thought for a long time to be culturally specific, that it would just be found in the Western world. But that's not the case. Preferences for pink in girls is universal. Every girl on the planet likes the color pink. And why might this be the case? Well, it's thought that it stems from our evolutionary past, when we were gatherers, when females had to go out into the bush and look for ripe fruit. As a consequence of that task, we developed a very good way of discriminating between different shades of red. Certain red colors were associated with ripeness, and certain were not, so you'd avoid the, po uh, uh, the poisonous fruit. And as a consequence of that, the female brain changed in structure. And now, in modern days, this female brain then shows a preference for the color pink. When our son was born, people were very generous with the presents that they gave us when he was born. But what I was worried about was that all the presents that we received were blue. And I began to think, OK, I know about how the visual system rapidly develops over the first six, 12 months of life, and I know how dependent that is on experience. And I started to fret that our son was not going to develop the ability to be able to discriminate between colors at the red end of the color spectrum. <laughs> but his dad, the hero, saved the day and turned our son into the most avid Milan supporter <laughs> with an obsession for Ferrari cars and Ducati motorbikes. Now I don't have to worry that he, ha he can't see the color red. So, what do we know about the way the brain processes information that it receives from the senses? Well, we know, for example, that the brain looks for regularities in the, in the sensory information that it receives. It looks for repeated patterns or common patterns. And we took this idea and created an experiment recently, which was hosted by the Science Gallery in the Illusion exhibition. And we simply asked the question, well, if the brain finds it easier to process regular patterns, then we should be able to find that those kind of patterns are preferred. And that's exactly what we found. We found that people showed a very strong preference for these types of images, then these, and least of all, these images. So, in other words, we show preference for things that the brain finds easiest to process. Another type of feature that's regular is motion. And 
our participants, there were over a thousand participants, by the way, also found this type of regular motion pattern to be a lot more aesthetically pleasing than a pattern in which all the elements did their own thing. And we also know through neuroscience that there's a region in the brain that is specifically tuned to, to these types of correlated motion. So if the brain likes this and can process it easily, we're going to have a preference for that type of stimulation. Now, another regular pattern that is all around us is symmetry especially in the natural world, but also in the man-made world. There are lots of objects that are made that are symmetrical. And symmetry is also a very strong feature to, that we prefer. And in the natural world, it works quite well because it's correlated with the health of that individual animal. The more symmetrical the animal is, the more likely it's going to get a mate. And in the human world, we also find that symmetrical faces are preferred. But Perfectly symmetrical faces are very rare. It's very difficult to find a perfectly symmetrical face. And even when a face moves, that symmetry is broken down. So symmetry cannot be the only feature that we look for when we're creating aesthetic judgments. So apart from regularities, another way in which the brain learns and shapes itself is by repeated exposure to different types of stimuli. And this is called familiarity. So the more often it sees something, the more likely it's going to shape itself around that information. So this then gives us a second prediction. That's what's familiar is preferred. And that's exactly the case. So there is work from social psychology, and this, is called, this effect is known as the mere exposure effect. And it goes like this. The more often you see an image of a face, the more you're going to like that face. And we have replicated this effect in our lab by showing two exposures or four exposures or six exposures of a face, people's attractiveness ratings of that face goes up. This is good news for the blobfish, because all he has to do is appear more often in the Irish Times and people will start to like it. So familiarity can have a very rapid effect on how the brain is structured. And we know this from developmental psychology. Newborn babies who are just hours old have already acquired enough knowledge about faces to be able to show preferences for attractive faces over less attractive faces. So they will stare for longer <laughs> at an attractive face than they will at an unattractive face. Finally, we know from work on memory that the way in which the brain takes in all of that huge amount of data and stores that information is not in discrete bits of um, information about every object or every event that we've ever come across in our lives. Instead, it stores that information in prototypes or averages. So we'll have an average in our memory system to represent a certain category of objects. So if this is the way memory works, then it should be the case that we should have a preference for things that are average, not things that are distinct. And there is a huge amount of evidence to support this idea. Here I'm showing you two images of average faces, which were computer-generated from 200 faces of students attending a German university. 200 female faces go into the image on the left, and male faces on the image on the right. And attractiveness ratings to these type of faces are much greater than the attractiveness ratings to any of the individual faces that c comprise these averages. Now, we took this idea again into the science gallery in a, an exhibition called The Love Lab, where we asked people to volunteer to have their photograph taken, because we wanted to create Irish um, average faces. And we did this with four categories of faces, two females and two male categories in two different age groups, in their 40s and in their 20s. We created averages of 100 faces for each category. Here's an average male face in their 40s. Female in her 40s, male in his 20s, and female in her 20s. So if this idea of averageness is correct, then these should be Ireland's favorite faces. It doesn't just work for faces. Memory also has to memorize other types of objects. And we also created an average car by taking images of all the kinds of cars that we normally see in our everyday world. And this is the kind of car that resulted. And if you want proof 
This is the car that is preferred. Just look at the cars around you on the streets of Dublin, and they will match the characteristics of this car here. It also works for furniture. The, the chair on the left was rated as being more attractive than the one on the right, and it's also perceived as being more average. So what we're left with, then, is knowledge about how the brain processes the information that it gets from the sensory world and how it makes sense of all that information. And it's through those processes that our sense of the aesthetic is derived. In other words, it's from the very ordinary things that surround us that aesthetics are derived from. So beauty comes from the ordinary. Thank you.